Book 1. Chapter 1. Aircraft Basics. Unit 1. Parts of an Airplane. Exercise 1. Page 4. The differences between small fighters and large cargo planes are obvious, but all fixed-wing aircraft require the same basic structures. Every airplane has wings attached to the fuselage. The cockpit sits behind the nose, and the tail supports the vertical and horizontal stabilizers. Rudders, ailerons, and elevators control direction. Flaps provide lift. Aircraft roll on landing gear during takeoff and landing. But not all airplanes have the same type of engine. Most modern military airplanes have turbine engines. Other airplanes use turboprops. These are more efficient for medium sized transports. Exercises 4 and 5, page 5. This airplane is a C 130 Hercules. As you can see, it's a turboprop plane. It can transport almost anything to almost anywhere. It can hold helicopters and small armored vehicles. They're loaded through a large cargo door beneath the tail. Two pilots sit in the cockpit above the nose, and as many as 128 combat troops can sit in the main fuselage. The landing gear is very strong, so it can land or take off on rough dirt and even ice. Unit 2. Parts of a Helicopter Exercise 1, page 6 Troops must move in or out of dangerous combat zones quickly. No aircraft does that better than helicopters. The design of rotary wing aircraft allows them to take off or land in almost any area. The mast rotates two or more rotor blades which lift the helicopter straight up. Swash plates control the flight angle and synchronized elevators stabilize it. The tail rotor and stabilizer bar provide the pilot with precise control. Skids or landing gear support the helicopter when it lands to load or unload troops and supplies. Tail skids protect the tail boom during landings. The motor mount holds the engine in place, and the cowling covers the engine to protect it from damage in flight or combat. It also redirects airflow. Exercise 4, page 7. Sergeant Thompson, I think this rotor blade is damaged. Are you sure? Let me take a look. I'm sure, sir. There's a small crack right above the swash plate. This bird saw some action yesterday. It must be from small arms fire. Can you fix it? I don't think so, sir. We'll have to replace the whole blade. You're right. We can't risk that crack getting any bigger. Unit 3. Spatial Relationships. Exercise 1. Page 8. Modern aircraft perform rapid maneuvers that lead to successful missions. A bomber dives to deliver its payload and then ascends rapidly to avoid anti-aircraft fire. Fighters climb above a target in seconds and destroy the enemy below them. And helicopters descend straight down to offload special forces. All of these movements occurs on three key axes. Up or down movement from the elevators changes pitch. Left or right movement of the rudder changes yaw. And deflecting elevators causes roll. Every flight and air engagement involves changes in all three. Exercises 4 and 5, page 9. Airman Wilson, turn to a heading of 057 degrees. Use rudder to control yaw as you roll. Then start the climbing exercise. Yes, sir. What is the appropriate altitude? We'll start with a climb above 8,000. Start to ascend. Climbing. Do you feel that pressure on the stick? You should adjust your pitch. You're climbing too fast. Yes, sir. Perfect. Hold this course until we level at 8,000. Then we'll practice coordinating our turns to control your... Unit 4, Radio Communication. Exercise 1, page 10. Radio communication is a vital part of every mission. A delay or miscommunication can be the difference between life and death. As a result, radio operators use code words to avoid errors and express information quickly. For example, the phonetic alphabet uses the word Charlie to represent the letter C. This prevents the letter C from being misunderstood as a B or D. Pro words provide quick ways to communicate longer messages. Roger, over, say again, and Wilco are common pro words that shorten communications. Still, some pro words are intentionally longer. For example, affirmative and negative are easier to understand through a weak radio connection than yes and no.
Exercises 4 and 5, page 11. Mike 1-1, one, one. this is Bravo 3-4. Bravo 3-4, this is Mike 1-1, one, one. go ahead. Mike 1-1, one, one. are we clear to land on runway 19er? Negative, Bravo 3-4, we have an accident on scene. Roger. Be advised, Mike 1-1, one, one. we're low on fuel. Bravo 3-4, proceed to runway 1-2. Say again, Mike 1-1, one, one. which runway? I say again, runway 1-2. Roger, Mike 1-1. One, one. Clear to land 1-2. Two. Chapter 2, On Base. Unit 5, Rank Structure. Exercise 1, page 12. A recruit may hope to become a general someday, but he or she will start at the lowest rank. All enlisted airmen begin duty in the airman tier. Eventually, they can work their way up to the non-commissioned officer tier. Such a move requires more leadership and responsibility. Exceptional airmen can reach the highest level for enlisted airmen, the senior non-commissioned officer tier. On the other hand, officers are commissioned based on their education, experience and qualifications. They begin as company-grade officers, who are either lieutenants or captains. Like airmen, officers also have potential to increase their rank. Officers who show the most promise become field-grade officers, such as majors and colonels. A very select few become flag officers or generals. Exercise 4, page 13. Hello, Airman. How are you today? I'm doing fine, sir. How can I help you? I have good news. You've been promoted to Staff Sergeant. Thank you, sir. That's great news. As a result, you'll move from the 6th Squadron to the 9th. Yes, sir. But may I ask why? Staff Sergeant Jackson in the 9th Squadron made Technical Sergeant. You'll take his place. Yes, sir. I'll pack immediately. Unit 6, Base Structures. Exercise 1, page 14. An Air Force base is more than a military installation. It is a complete community and support system. Airmen can live on base in a dormitory or a residence in family housing. Food and other goods are available at the commissary and BX, base exchange stores. The Consolidated Support Building offers financial support, education, and even basic household items. Security forces work out of the law enforcement armory. Badges and IDs from the Pass and Registration Office give airmen access to the base. Of course, not all buildings on base are accessible. For instance, enlisted airmen cannot enter the officer's club. Exercise 4, page 14. Over here we have the base dormitories. If you don't already know, the rooms are pretty small. I'd recommend looking at off-base housing if you prefer more space. You can get housing info at the Consolidated Support Building. Now, on the left is the Pass and Registration Office. You'll have to get a temporary ID there to get back into the base. Often, airmen want to bring personal firearms when they move in. If you do, you'll have to drop them off at the law enforcement armory on the right. Unit 7, NATO Organization. Exercise 1, page 15. 28 nations, 28 militaries. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, is one of the largest alliances ever formed. A group called the Military Committee oversees all NATO military operations. This committee has representatives from every member nation. Together, they decide how to deploy and train NATO forces. Allied Command Operations, ACO, and Allied Command Transformation, ACT, follow those orders. ACO is responsible for all strategic, operation and combat management. It is led by the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, SACUR. The SACUR operates out of Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, SHAPE. Below SHAPE are three joint force commands, JFCs. The JFCs handle operations in different regions of the NATO Area of Responsibility, AOR. ACT is led by the Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic, SACLANT, and provides training for NATO forces. The Joint Warfare Center, JWC, ensures that all member nation forces can work together. Subdivisions such as the Joint Force Training Center, JFTC, and NATO Undersea Research Center, NURC, provide training and research NATO methods. These actions improve ACO operations. Exercise 4, page 16. 
Excuse me, are you Major Stevens? Yes, I am. And you are? Major Casey, we've been expecting you. You're from the JFTC, correct? Yes, I'm here to help with the pre-deployment training. Yeah, JFC is expecting some activity in our AOR. So is this mostly computer-based training? There are a few computer-based mission simulations, but mostly we want to run field operations. It's the best way to teach tactical standards to officers. Unit 8, Military Organization. Exercise 1, page 17. Air Force units often deploy with little notice. For that reason, subcommands are highly organized. A wing is the basic unit of a subcommand. Each wing is made up of several divisions. These divisions are, from largest to smallest, groups, squadrons, flights, and sections. There are usually maintenance, operations, mission support, and medical groups within a wing. Each group ensures that a wing is equipped, prepared, and healthy to deploy. The wing staff, along with the wing commander, also joins the groups on deployment. Exercise 4, page 18. Lieutenant Adams, I need to speak with you. Yes, Colonel? We might deploy to the conflict in San Clemente tomorrow. I need the group commanders in my office to discuss their roles. Yes, sir. I'll schedule a meeting in one hour. Do that. Also, have maintenance group perform another check on each cargo aircraft. Yes, sir. Also, have mission support ready to load the cargo in an hour. I want the entire wing ready by 1700 hours. Will do, sir. Unit 9, Training. Exercise 1, page 19. Becoming an airman requires more than just enlisting. Recruits undergo eight weeks of intense physical and mental exercises known as basic military training, BMT. Recruits learn the fundamentals of the Air Force. In this period, recruits also experience basic situation awareness training and IED familiarization. These skills can save many lives in combat. BMT also instructs them on defensive fighting positions and entry control points. The seaborne portion of BMT trains recruits to react to chemical, biological, or nuclear attack. All recruits must also undergo expeditionary training to prepare for ground operations. After BMT, airmen go to technical training. There they focus on an AFSC, such as a specialty in medical, computer, or intelligence training. Exercise 4, page 19. Sergeant Maxwell. What training is scheduled for Monday? Monday is still basic situational awareness. Oh, that's right. It goes until Tuesday? No, Monday is the last day. Then we move into DFPs. Are you sure? I think Tuesday is BSA also. I'm certain. I have the schedule right here. Tuesday is DFPs. And on Wednesday we start entry control points. Got it. Do you want me to lead the DFP lecture? Sure. I'll take entry control points. Unit 10, Uniforms. Exercise 1, page 20. Airmen serve in many locations and circumstances, on base, in the field, and everywhere in between. But different areas of service require different uniforms and headgear. The service dress and mess dress are standardized dress uniforms. The utility uniform, or Airman Battle Uniform, ABU, is used by ground personnel for work duty. The ABU is also used for combat. A special uniform is the flight suit. This durable cloth is only used as a uniform by flight crews on missions. But no matter which uniform is worn, all airmen wear insignia to display their rank. Exercise 4, page 20. Listen up. You're all familiar with this. The airman battle uniform. I need to clarify some rules about it. Only wear it when on duty. Yes, you are permitted to wear this off base, but not during civilian activities. What I mean is, don't wear it when you aren't working for us. Most importantly, do not wear your ABU at any establishment that sells alcohol. An airman was reprimanded for that last week, and I do not want to see it happen again. Chapter 3 Jobs Unit 11 Pilot. Exercise 1, page 21. Few jobs are more difficult to obtain than that of a pilot. 
Becoming a military pilot involves meeting strict requirements and undergoing extensive training. Airmen must first pass initial flight screening (IFS). This is a preliminary flight training course. The next step is to attend either Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training (ENJPT) or Specialized Undergraduate Pilot Training (SUPT). Trainee pilots learn various types of flight, including contact flight, instrument flight, low-level flight, and formation flight. Then students specialize in a type of aircraft. Some may fly fighter jets, bombers, or tankers for in-flight refueling. Others may become airlift mission experts. Exercise four, page twenty-two. So you want to become a pilot? Yeah. I've always wanted to fly a fighter jet. Then the air force is the place for you. But I'll be honest, becoming a fighter pilot isn't easy. What do you have to do? Well, if you pass initial flight screening, you go on to specialised undergraduate pilot training. Then I could fly a jet. Maybe. The leaders in each class choose their assignments first, so fighter positions go quickly. But you'd still have the opportunity to fly tankers and bombers. Unit Twelve, Air Traffic Control, Exercise One, Page Twenty-Three. A military airfield is a hectic and dangerous place. Aircraft loaded with weapons and troops take off and land at high speeds. Someone must direct aircraft to avoid accidents. This is the job of an air traffic controller (ATC). An ATC plots positions of aircraft on radar. They compute altitudes and airspeeds of incoming planes. They constantly relay information to pilots in the air and pilots taxiing on the ground. This maintains clear runways and taxiways in order to avoid collisions. ATCs must be able to handle incredible stress. Because their job is so critical, they receive training in order to become certified. Exercise four, page twenty-three. Steady head tower. This is Tango Delta one five seven approaching airfield. Acknowledge. Tango Delta One Five Seven. This is Steadyhead. Continued descent to four thousand. This is Tango Delta One Five Seven. Level at four thousand. Tango Delta One Five Seven cleared for approach to runway two. Steadyhead, say again. Which runway for Tango Delta One Five Seven? I say again, cleared for approach runway two. Roger that, Steadyhead. Tango Delta One Five Seven cleared to approach runway two. Tango Delta One Five Seven, you are clear to land. Wind is two two zero at nine. Roger that, Steadyhead. Tango Delta One Five Seven, clear to land. Unit Thirteen, Maintenance. Exercise One, Page Twenty Four. In combat, a flight crew's lives depend on their aircraft. A mechanical failure could mean death, so military aircraft require regular maintenance to keep them functional and in good condition. Before and after every flight, maintenance personnel perform preventative inspections. This assures that aircraft are fully mission capable (FMC). They check every aspect of the aircraft, from fuel levels to hydraulic fluid. If they find a problem, it must be repaired before clearing the aircraft for flight. Aircraft maintenance is a great responsibility. It requires mechanical and electrical knowledge. Maintenance personnel also receive special training from expert mechanics before and during every deployment. Pilots may get all the glory, but they would have no aircraft without skilled maintenance crews on the ground. Exercise four, page twenty-four. Well, she's got new tires and brakes, but I still can't say she's FMC. What's the problem now? It's the hydraulic line. See that fluid on the ground. You could find the leak and patch it. That's a lot of fluid. There could be multiple leaks. We should replace the whole line. You're right. I'll see what I can do. Unit fourteen, para rescue, exercise one, page twenty-five. That others may live. That is the motto of the Air Force's Special Operations Para Rescue Technicians. These highly trained experts, known as PJs. Conduct personnel recovery operations in combat zones. They often put their own lives at risk. They also perform search and rescue (SAR) operations for civilians. No matter where someone is lost, PJs can reach them. They are even proficient in scuba diving for underwater operations.
Often troops needing rescue are also injured. For that reason, PJs are also excellent paramedics. They can treat battle wounds and provide CPR. But PJs must be in excellent physical condition. Before becoming a PJ, airmen must pass a difficult test. Only the strongest airmen pass the physical ability and stamina test. Passed. Exercise 4, page 26. Captain, a UH 1N went down in Sector 5. You're leading the SAR operation. Yes, sir. How many were on board? Three. The pilot, co pilot, and engineer. They went in hard, so expect to treat injured. Were they shot down? No, the tail rotor failed. But there is hostile activity in that sector. So we need to get there now. Is that understood? Yes, sir. My team will launch in two minutes. Unit 15, weather. Exercise 1, page 27. Enemy fire isn't the only threat that can bring down an aircraft. Poor weather conditions cause crashes as well. But accurate forecasts can avoid such accidents. For that reason, the Air Force needs weather airmen. Weather officers have a college degree in meteorology. Enlisted weather personnel attend courses to learn the basics of analyzing and predicting weather patterns. Both officers and enlisted weather personnel deploy to a hub for extended training. At a hub, weather airmen use computer models to study activity in the atmosphere. Their predictions help leadership plan missions. If they recognize dangerous conditions such as high wind speeds, they can recommend that leadership ground all flights. In this way, weather personnel keep aircraft and airmen safe without even firing a weapon. Weather presents several threats to air crews. Lightning and thunderstorms can disable electrical systems. Clouds, fog, snow, hail, and rain can limit visibility. Wind gusts can cause turbulence, and icing and cold weather can prevent pilots from maneuvering. But these different threats are formed by the same factors temperature and atmospheric pressure. Temperature not only creates wind but also influences precipitation. Pressure changes wind speeds and direction. Studying those factors helps weather personnel predict how different weather fronts will interact. Exercise 5, page 28. Lieutenant Ryan, what's today's weather report? Sir, unfortunately, wind speeds look much higher than we expected. How fast are we talking? I predict 20 to 25 miles per hour at times. I see. Our PJs are supposed to run a parachuting exercise today. What do you think? I wouldn't recommend it, sir. I'd ground all unnecessary flights. No use risking injury for a routine training exercise, I suppose. When do you expect calmer weather? Tomorrow, the winds should be much lower. I'll reschedule the exercise for tomorrow then. Thank you, Lieutenant. That will be all. Glossary Above Affirmative Aileron AFSC Air Force Specialty Code Air Traffic Controller ATC Airfield Airlift Airman Battle Uniform ABU Airman tier. Airspeed. Altitude. Analyze. Ascend. Atmosphere. Atmospheric pressure. Axis. Basic military training. BMT. Basic Situational Awareness BSA Training Below BX Base Exchange Captain Certify Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear and High Yield Explosives Seaborne Training Climb Cloud Cockpit Colonel Commissary Company Grade Officer Compute Computer Model Condition Connection
consolidated support building. Contact flight. Cowling. CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Defensive fighting position, DFP. Descend. Dive. Direct. Dormitory. Elevator. Enlisted. Entry control point, ECP. Euro NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training, NJEPT. Expeditionary Training. Family Housing. Field Grade Officer. Fixed Wing. Flag Officer. Flap. Flight. Flight Suit. Fog. Forecast. Formation Flight. Front. Fuel. Fully Mission Capable. FMC. Functional. Fuselage. General. Ground. Group. Gust. Hail. Headgear. Horizontal stabilizer. Hub. Hydraulic fluid. Icing. Improvised explosive device, IED, familiarization. Initial flight screening, IFS. Injured. Insignia. Inspection. Instrument flight. Landing gear. Law enforcement armory. Lieutenant. Lightning. Low level flight. Maintain. Maintenance. Maintenance group. Major. Maneuver. Mast. Medical group. Mestress. Meteorology. Mission support group. Motor mount. NCO, non-commissioned officer, tier. Negative. Nose. Officer. Officers club. Operations group. Over. Paramedic. Pararescue. Pass and registration office. Past. Physical ability and stamina test. Phonetic alphabet. Pitch. PJ. Plot. Precipitation. Predict. Preventative. Proficient. Radio communication. Proword. Rank. Recommend. Relay. Repair. Roger. Roll. Rotary wing. Rotor blade. Rudder. Runway. Say again. Scuba. Search and rescue. SAR. Senior non-commissioned officer tier. Service dress. Skid. Snow. 
Specialized Undergraduate Pilot Training, SUPT. Squadron. Stabilizer bar. Stress. Subcommand. Swashplate. Synchronized elevator. Tail. Tail boom. Tail rotor. Tail skid. Tanker. Taxi. Technical training. Temperature. Thunderstorm. Treat. Turbine engine. Turboprop. Turbulence. Utility uniform. Vertical stabilizer. Visibility. Wilco. Wind speed. Wing. Wing. Wing commander. Wing staff. Your. Book two, chapter one, aircraft. Unit one, the fighter jet. Exercise one, page four. Military leaders seeking air superiority will turn to one type of aircraft: the fighter jet. Fighters are small, highly maneuverable, high-speed aircraft equipped with powerful weapons for air-to-air -air combat. Fighter pilots sit at the front of the aircraft in the cockpit, beneath a transparent canopy. A fighter jet's fuselage holds one or more weapons bays containing bombs or missiles. Fighter jet engines use thrust nozzles to constrict airflow and cause jet propulsion that reaches max speeds. Many fighter jets have turbofan engines for quieter, more efficient flight. Most have an afterburner for additional thrust during takeoff and in critical air combat situations. Modern fighter jets are equipped with sophisticated weaponry and flight technology. Fly-by-wire controls automatically react to atmospheric conditions without pilot input. A front-firing cannon with several hundred rounds can destroy enemy aircraft. Electro-optical targeting systems track targets with deadly precision, and self-defense systems enable pilots to apply countermeasures against incoming missiles. These characteristics make fighter jets the primary weapons for maintaining air superiority in military conflicts. Exercises four and five, page five. Lieutenant Toombs, tell me the maximum speed of a MiG thirty-five. Captain Mac two point two five or one thousand four hundred ninety-one miles per hour. And what is the service ceiling on that aircraft, Lieutenant? Seventeen thousand five hundred meters, sir. The enemy is flying a MiG thirty-five, Lieutenant. You are on his tail in an F thirty-five Lightning two. He detects you and engages afterburners to escape. Can you overtake him? Sir, um, yes, sir, I can, sir. What did you say was the maximum speed of a MiG thirty-five, Lieutenant? Mach two point two five, sir. And what is the maximum speed of your aircraft? Only Mach one point six. I repeat, can you overtake the MiG thirty-five, Lieutenant? No, Captain Ellis, not in that aircraft, sir. Unit two, UAVs. Exercise one, page six. Can a pilot engage an enemy without leaving the ground? Today, that's quite possible. UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles do not need a pilot or crew on board. Instead, pilots on the ground fly them by using remote control. These aircraft have multiple functions. Many are used in training exercises that are too risky for human pilots. These UAVs simulate enemy aircraft and serve as targets for crews to engage. Some target drones are expendable, but the majority of them are recoverable. For these UAVs, 
Crews fire dummy munitions that do not destroy the drone. Instead, radar measurements detect whether or not the target would have been damaged. In the field, sensor equipped UAVs provide ISR and target acquisition. Other UAVs serve as decoys. They fly into enemy territory to test enemy response capabilities. Still, other UAVs fly air interdiction missions. They engage targets in situations that are too dangerous for human pilots or ground forces. These UAVs also provide CAS for ground troops. Exercise 4, page 7. Listen up. Today I'll introduce you to the MQ 1B Predator. It's a medium altitude UAV. Its primary mission is to supply armed ISR and target acquisition. Each Predator has three crew members. First is the pilot, who flies the aircraft. Now, the pilot isn't on board, but he sits in a cockpit, just like he's flying any other aircraft. Then there's the sensor operator, who conducts surveillance and target identification for onboard weapons. So, you can see, the sensor operator is just as busy as the pilot. Last, there's the mission coordinator, who ensures that each operation goes according to plan. A satellite link provides remote control to the crew, but they operate hundreds of miles away from the theater in which the Predator is deployed. Unit 3, the Bomber. Exercise 1, page 8. Although fighter jets can carry many weapons, no fighter can match the destructive capability of a bomber. Bombers are military aircraft designed to drop bombs on enemy ground troops, facilities, and territories. There are several types of designs to meet the requirements of bomber missions. Almost all designs employ a bomb bay within their fuselage to carry the bombs before dropping them. Some bombers have a blended wing body to carry a greater payload, others have a swept wing body. For greater lift on shorter runways and faster, more efficient cruising during long range flights. A long range strike mission is usually a strategic bomber mission. This involves flying deep into enemy territory to drop bombs on strategic targets like supply bases, bridges, or even entire cities. A tactical bomber mission aims at bombing tactical targets. Such as enemy troops and equipment. Though all bombers feature defensive weapons, some are better equipped for air to air operations. Fighter bombers are designed to conduct air superiority operations in addition to completing bombing missions. Exercise 4, page 9. Here's the proposed schedule for Operation Eardrum. It's a long range strike mission to Zone 317. A radar station and two radar towers. Three strategic targets, two B 1 Lancers. Hmm. Is there something wrong? 700 miles into enemy territory without an air superiority escort. What if they have surface to air capabilities out there? At a radar station in the middle of the desert? If we have a reason to hit it, they have a reason to protect it. Recon doesn't show any SAMs. Plus, the Lancers have missile defense. But there are only two of them, and we have multiple targets to destroy. They should have an escort. Two F 22 Raptors. OK, a y I'll adjust the schedule. Did you say two Raptors? Yes, two of them. Better safe than sorry. Unit 4 Cargo Airplanes. Exercise 1, page 10. Some of the most important military aircraft don't fly combat missions. But without them, no combat mission could succeed. These cargo aircraft, called airlifters, are used for the deployment of troops and equipment into combat zones. They are also used for redeployment from one zone to another. Deployments by aircraft, or airlifts, often involve transporting cargo thousands of miles in intercontinental flights. For convenient loading and unloading, airlift cargo is often stacked and loaded on pallets. 
Airlift missions can be completed either by airland or airdrop. The ability to drop cargo without landing greatly increases the potential range and possible locations of airlift missions. Airlifts are often necessary for the sustainment of longer combat operations. Not all airlifts are for deployment or combat supply. An aeromedical evacuation is the transportation by aircraft of injured soldiers out of battle zones. Cargo aircraft are also required for military operations other than war, mutwa. These may include the delivery of troops or humanitarian aid on peacekeeping missions. Exercises 4 and 5, page 11. So, have you been briefed on tomorrow's flight? No, sir. I just landed a half hour ago. I was not a resupply mission. Well, you'll be taking off again in the morning, so listen close. Yes, sir. We'll be loading your aircraft with 57 troops and two Abrams tanks. Sounds like a lot. How heavy are we talking here? Upwards of £110,000. Well, that's cutting it close, but we can lift it. Are they headed to the same location, or will we do two stops? Both are headed to Holland Base in Zone 197. It's a 900-mile flight. At least we won't have to refuel. Unit 5, Gunships. Exercise 1, page 12. Although nearly every military aircraft is armed, few present a greater threat to enemy ground units than gunships. These heavily armed aircraft use their massive firepower in various types of missions. They commonly serve in convoy escort, force protection and air interdiction missions. They may attack pre-planned targets or targets of opportunity. Two common gunships are the AC-130H and the AC-130U. These side-firing gunships can provide surgical firepower and area saturation even at night or in bad weather. Side-firing gunships often attack by circling targets in a banking turn while firing deadly munitions. This leaves the gunship vulnerable so the manoeuvre usually requires the support of air superiority aircraft. Another attack method of gunships is strafing. In this type of attack, aircraft supply heavy machine gun fire while flying past. Strafing leaves a gunship less vulnerable, and so it requires less air support. Exercise 4, page 13. Okay, there should be two targets, one on each side of the road, one kilometre apart. Roger that, and I've got visual on north target one. Let's go for it. Veer left. Hold on, I've got visual on south target two. I think we should move on north one. We just need to be a little closer. You'll have your shot at 200 feet. We'll split the system. You take north one. Check left and north one is toast, Captain. Just wait. We're strafing at 200 feet. We're going to hit them both. Yes, sir. Approaching 200 feet in 07 seconds. Hold your fire. Roger. 3, 2, 1, fire. Firing. Target North 1 destroyed, Captain. Good work, Sergeant. I'm targeting South Target 2. Unit 6, Tankers. Exercise 1, page 14. Modern aircraft have an almost limitless range. They can fly as far or as long as their human crews can work effectively. This is made possible by mid-air refueling. Tanker aircraft are specially designed for this job. They carry fuel and can deliver it to other aircraft while flying. The most common methods of aerial refueling are the flying boom method and the probe and drogue method. In the flying boom method, a boom operator lowers a rigid tube to the receiving aircraft. The probe and drogue method uses a flexible tube and requires no manual inputs from the boom operator. Probe and drogue is used in most multipoint refueling systems, MPRS. The MPRS allows two or more aircraft 
to refuel with one tanker at the same time. Some types of aircraft are equipped with one or more wingtip pods for fuel reception via the wing. But aerial refueling is difficult and dangerous. For that reason, automatic load alleviation systems and independent disconnect systems assist pilots during the procedure. Exercises 4 and 5, page 15. Okay, Lieutenant. Ready for briefing on tomorrow's refueling mission? Yes, Mom. What do we have? You'll be refueling a flight of FA-18s in Zone 1 and a flight of F-22s in Zone 2. Zone 1 FA-18s will be on the left? That's correct, the north side. Refuel them with the MPRS, Drogue first. And then the F-22s are next? That's correct. But with those F-22s, you should complete the refueling quickly, in less than 15 minutes. By then, we'll be getting pretty close to hot zone 6, won't we? Right again, Lieutenant. That's why you'll have to fill them up and get out. Yes, Mom. Any questions, Lieutenant? No, Mom. Unit 7, Reconnaissance Aircraft. Exercise 1, page 16. Without information about the enemy, military leaders cannot plan effectively. Reconnaissance, recon, aircraft provide them with that necessary information. These relatively slow aircraft have a large wingspan, so struts are often needed to hold the wing steady. They fly at high altitudes to avoid ground fire. Recon planes are equipped with radar technology to detect enemy units. The radar antenna is located in the plane's radar dome. More advanced planes have a rotodome, which spins to provide better radar coverage. Recon planes can provide surveillance of enemy forces in nearly any theatre. They are often responsible for airborne battle management, where real-time information about enemy units is passed to ground forces. Command and control, C2, operations are even conducted from these airborne monitors. Exercise 4, page 17. Our E-8 Joint Stars performed standard surveillance and tracking of enemy forces in the active southeastern theatre. Our radar detected two large moving objects. We identified the objects as T-72 tanks. We relayed this information to C-2. Instead of proceeding forward as planned, ground forces halted to allow an airstrike. The enemy coordinates were then given to A-10 pilots who took immediate action. After the threat was cleared, we examined the area and determined it was safe for ground advancement. Unit 8. Helicopters. Exercise 1, page 19. The fighter jet may be fast, but it can't compare to the manoeuvrability of a helicopter. The most relied upon helicopter is the HH-60G Pave Hawk. HH-60Gs are used effectively in low-level operations, such as resupply missions or personnel recovery. Because HH-60Gs have a cargo hook, which is capable of carrying an external load of up to 8,000 pounds, 3,600 kilograms, they can transport heavy cargo to troops at ground level. When HH-60G pave hawks are needed overseas, their folding rotor blades allow them to be transported in airlifters. HH-60Gs are ideal for special operations such as search and rescue, SAR. They are equipped with a forward-looking infrared system. This allows pilots to find people even at night by detecting their body heat. Furthermore, the Pave Hawk can rescue troops in places where it cannot land by hovering over them and using a hoist with a lift capacity of 600 pounds, 270 kilograms. In combat search and rescue, CSAR, missions, pilots must take greater precaution due to potential hostile activity. For this reason, HH-60Gs are equipped with armor plating and .50 caliber machine guns. Exercise 4, page 19. 
Captain Mayers, we're launching a CSAR mission at 0700 hours. You're leading it. Yes, sir. What exactly are we looking at? A gunship was downed in Sector 7. We need to get that crew out. How big is the crew? There are ten men. At the moment, there is one casualty who might need the hoist. But they're taking fire, so there could be more wounded when you arrive. Yes, sir. So we're expecting hostiles? Yes. There are about 15 troops surrounding our team. And there have been reports of SAMs in the area, so get in quick and get out. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Understood. Unit 9. Cruise missiles. Exercise 1, page 20. If you combine the speed and maneuverability of a jet with the destructive power of a missile, you get the cruise missile. Although it has some of the capabilities of a jet, a cruise missile is not considered to be an actual aircraft. The aerodynamic fins that make up the tail assembly and wings of a cruise missile are almost identical to those of some fixed-wing aircraft. But these non-ballistic missiles are not designed for multiple flights. The rest of the missile is designed to support the warhead, which explodes upon impact with a target. Cruise missiles equipped with nuclear-capable warheads are among the most destructive weapons ever created. Cruise missiles use several methods to stay on course and hit their targets. A global positioning system, GPS, tracks the missile's location relative to the world. At the same time, an inertial navigation system, INS, calculates the missile's location according to the movement it has made. Terrain Contour Matching, TERCOM, prevents low-flying missiles from colliding into prominent landmasses. When a target is near, the Digital Scene Mapping Area Correlator, DISMAC, and the Automatic Target Recognition, ATR, system ensure that the intended target is engaged. Exercise 4, page 21. The AGM-129 Advanced Cruise Missile is an impressive piece of missile technology. It's equipped with a turbofan engine that can reach a top speed of 500 miles per hour. It's a nuclear-capable, non-ballistic missile that uses INS and TERCOM navigation systems. However, the AGM-129 isn't unique because of its speed or navigation technologies. It's different from other missiles because it's almost impossible to detect. The engine exhaust is cooled so that heat won't be detected by infrared radars. Also, the missile's radar cross-section is greatly reduced because of the streamlined wing and engine design. In short, the AGM-129 is a little surprise that the enemy won't even see coming. Chapter 2 Operations Unit 10 Suppression of Enemy Air Defense Exercise 1, page 22 Because air attack is a crucial aspect of modern warfare, Combatants always take measures to detect and destroy enemy aircraft. To maintain air superiority, pilots conduct suppression of enemy air defense, SEED, missions. SEED missions seek to upset every aspect of an enemy's air defense system. This includes destroying not only anti-aircraft artillery, but also soft targets, such as radar facilities. Because they do great damage over a wide area, cluster bombs are often used in seed missions. The primary seed weapons, however, are anti-radiation missiles, ARMS. The AGM-88 HARM missile is an air-to-service arm that seeks and destroys any radar-equipped aspect of an enemy air defense system. The air-launched anti-radiation missile, ALARM, is a self-guided missile for the destruction of ground-based radar facilities. Other means of suppressing enemy air defense include the use of jammers to scramble and disrupt radar signals. Exercises 4 and 5, page 23. Sit down, Lieutenant Toombs. This is your briefing on tomorrow's SEED mission. Go ahead, sir. There are three targets. The first is a soft target, a ground-based radar facility in Zone 2. I assume we'll deploy CBUs. Yes, Lieutenant. Cluster bombs should do it. But this is your primary target, so confirm that it's destroyed. Use an AGM after the first attack, if you must. Will do, sir. Targets 2 and 3 are both AAA vehicles. Be sure to fire before you're in their range. One pass is all you're going to get. AGM-88, one apiece. 
I'll knock them out before they know I'm there. That's the plan. Do we have the coordinates? Recon will give you their exact locations once you're in the air. Unit 11, Humanitarian Operations. Exercise 1, page 25. Military airlifters don't always transport weapons and troops. They often engage in humanitarian operations. For example, medical civic action programs, MEDCAPs, treat local populations. In emergencies, up to 100 injured civilians can be treated on board specially modified C-130s. Other humanitarian operations include disaster relief and non-combatant evacuation orders, NEOs. In humanitarian operations, the Air Force works closely with international organizations, IOs, and non-governmental organizations, NGOs. These groups coordinate airlifts and supply drops, but they need Air Force aircraft to complete the missions. Usually, the recipients of Air Force humanitarian aid are refugees and dislocated civilians. Air Force airlifters transport security personnel, medical staff and medical equipment to aid these people. The most important function of Air Force humanitarian aid is food distribution in regions where traditional food supplies have been destroyed or disrupted. For example, during Operation Provide Promise, airlifters from over 20 countries flew nearly 13,000 sorties into Sarajevo. In doing so, they provided 160,000 tons of food and medicine to the population of the war-torn region. Exercise 4, page 25. Your attention, please. OK, let's get going. These are the specifications for airdrop 17B. You'll be airdropping 10 pallets in Zone 3. We have to spread them out. These people have been forced from their homes. Some of them haven't eaten in days. They're pretty desperate. Yes, they've all been passed as non-combatants. But if we spread the aid around the village, we can avoid a frantic mob around one drop site. I'm sure our troops on the ground will appreciate that. We'll spread three pallets out in the northwest quadrant and three in the southeast. The four medical pallets have to drop near the medcap site. The drop is scheduled for 0930. Unit 12, Counterterrorism Operations. Exercise 1, page 26. Large national armed forces are no longer the only threat facing modern nations. Small, organized terrorist organizations kill thousands of people a year. As a result, today's Air Force operations include counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency activities. Some counter-terrorism efforts involve preemptive attacks upon known terrorist organizations. Such attacks often involve a host nation that needs foreign internal defense, FID assistance, from a stronger military force. The host nation does much of the frontline combat. The assisting nation provides a surveillance platform with trained tech operators and analysts. When needed, the assisting military will apply their force in concentrated strikes on specific targets. This sometimes involves heliborne insertion and extraction of special forces. FID forces also engage in the targeted elimination of key participants in terrorist operations. UAVs frequently complete these missions. Preventing collateral damage is equally important in FID or counter-terrorism operations. By protecting civilians, FID forces prevent terrorist organizations from gaining popular support. Exercise 4, page 27. Captain, that's our target leaving the house. I see him. He's entering the car. Did you see anyone else in there? We have two other people. The driver and someone in the back seat. We've tracked this car before. Those aren't civilians in the car. Agreed. And he's a valid and approved target. Should I fire? Not yet. It's too crowded. I won't risk collateral damage. Understood. It looks like they're heading west. 
Good, that road leads out of the city. But they might turn. We've been looking for him for a long time. We may not get another chance. We should take the shot. Hold your fire. There's an empty intersection ahead of them. If it's still empty when they get there, we can fire. Do you have a lock? Locked, Captain. Hang on. Okay, civilians are clear. Take your shot. Roger. Firing, Fox One. All right. Hellfire missile has launched. And. Yes, that's a splash. Target is destroyed. Unit 13, Counter Drug Operations. Exercise 1, page 28. The Air Force protects citizens from many threats to national security, but these threats are not always violent attacks. The presence of illicit narcotics can also pose a serious danger to public safety. As a result, the Air Force participates in counter drug operations. The Air Force is active in the Joint Interagency Task Force, JIATF, a group designed to prevent drug smuggling operations. The JIATF's main goal is deterring the importation of drugs. To accomplish that, it uses UAVs and E9A turboprops to detect how and where smugglers bring drugs into the country. The next step is interdiction, which disrupts smugglers' operations. HH-60G PAVE Hawk helicopters perform these operations. The Air Force also works with other nations through the Theatre Security Cooperation Strategy, TSCS, to stop the movement of drugs across international borders. These counter-drug operations rely on the Air Force to detect watercraft, especially submersibles, that are transporting drugs. Air Force units then inform local law enforcement of the smuggler's location. Exercise 4, page 29. Major Wilson, we're ready to hear your report on the Gulf Coast operation. Sir, at 0900 hours, our E9As detected another submersible about 50 miles off the coast. Was it intercepted? Yes, sir. Local authorities had some difficulty spotting it from the boat. We dispatched the Pave Hawk to track it and provide directions. Law enforcement boarded the watercraft and arrested the crew. They found a shipment of narcotics weighing more than 1,000 kilos. Well done. That's the third one this year for your unit. Where did it come from? Unknown, sir. The crew is still being interviewed by the locals. I see. I'm pleased with your results, Major. I'd like a debriefing from the captain of the helicopter crew as soon as possible. Unit 14, Small-Scale Contingencies. Exercise 1, page 30. The Air Force can conduct massive operations that coordinate hundreds of sorties every day. But not all conflicts require such a large response. For example, a hostile nation might violate a no-fly zone. The Air Force must enforce the no-fly zone and demonstrate that such violations are not tolerated. Yet employing the full power of the Air Force would not be necessary or appropriate. In such cases, military leaders order a small-scale contingency, SSC, instead of resorting to a full-scale war. Unlike major theatre wars, MTW, SSCs have a narrow focus and use the minimum amount of necessary force. An SSC's force structure requires fewer units and its tactics inflict less damage. The Air Force can rapidly deploy aircraft into an area and remove them immediately after an operation is complete. A military operation might use limited intervention or show of force to stop a localised conflict from spreading. SSCs typically promote peace and regional stability, and they are designed to prevent further military action. However, unintentional mission creep can sometimes turn a peacekeeping operation into an actual war. For example, engaging targets from neighbouring regions or uninvolved nations can escalate a conflict. Exercise 4, page 31. All right, let's get started. This is going to be a sensitive SSC operation, and we want to get out of there as quickly as possible. Our mission is to contain this conflict and have stability in the region within two months. 
This is mainly a show of force. We won't actually be making any air-to-ground strikes unless things get worse. Hopefully, just being there will be enough to push back the rebels and restore control to the local government. To achieve this, we're deploying six C-17s and ten C-130s in Phase 1. They'll drop ground troops and equipment starting tomorrow. We also have ten F-16s standing by. If the rebels attack our ground units, the F-16s will provide close air support. Unit 15, close air support. Exercise 1, page 32. No operation is as useful for friendly forces or as deadly to hostile targets as an airstrike. But the close proximity of friendly and hostile forces in ground attacks often complicates airstrikes. A misplaced attack could result in friendly fire casualties. To avoid this, pilots and ground troops engage in close air support, CAS, procedures. This operation relies on detailed integration of forces to inflict maximum damage to enemy units and avoid friendly casualties. The Joint Terminal Attack Controllers, JTACs, and Forward Air Controllers, FACs, inform pilots of targets and locations. They receive that information from a Tactical Air Control Party, TACP, specially trained airmen who direct fire from the ground. Even after a pilot receives the targets and friendly forces locations, precise weaponry is still needed to ensure the attack only strikes enemy units. Usually, CAS pilots fire laser-guided weapons. These munitions strike targets that TACPs identify with lasers. This prevents the accidental targeting of friendly troops. However, it frequently places TACPs danger close. Directing CAS makes the TACP's specialty extremely important, but also extremely dangerous. Exercise 4, page 33. Foxtrot 1 Niner, this is Mark 2 1. Tally that heavy group of hostiles. It looks like an M1 tank and two armoured vehicles. Are we clear to fire? Over. Negative, Mike 2-1. Be advised, there's a division of friendly forces right there. They'll need you to take out those units. Cease fire until we have more information. Stand by. Roger, Foxtrot 1-Niner. Adjusting course and waiting for the go-ahead. Clear. All right. Our FAC has information from the TACP in the field. He's ready to coordinate CAS. Over. Roger. Mike 2-1 committed. Is his laser on? Affirmative. Laser on. Over. Roger, Foxtrot 1-Niner. Target is locked. TACP can terminate laser. Friendlies are clear. Confirm. Affirmative. You are cleared hot, Mike 2-1. Over. Roger. Bomb away. That's a splash on the M1 tank. Over. Roger. The armored vehicles are running. Friendlies on the ground will take it from here. Return to base. Glossary. Aeromedical Evacuation, A.E. Afterburner. AGM-88 Harm Missile. Air Defense System. Air Interdiction. Air Launched Anti-Radiation Missile, Alarm. Air Superiority. Airborne Battle Management Airdrop Airland Airlift Airlifter Air to Surface Anti-Aircraft Artillery, Triple A Anti-Radiation Missile, Arm Area Saturation Armor plating. Automatic load alleviation system. Automatic target recognition, ATR. Banking turn. Blended wing body. Bomb bay. Boom operator. Cannon. 
Canopy. Cargo. CAS. Close air support. Counter drug operation. Counter insurgency. Countermeasures. Counter terrorism. Civilian. Cluster bombs. Collateral damage. Combat search and rescue, CSAR. Command and control, C2. Convoy. Cruise missile. Danger close. Decoy. Defensive weapon. Deployment. Detailed integration. Detect. Deter. Digital scene mapping area correlator. DISMAC. Disaster relief. Dislocated civilian. Disrupt. Drogue. Drone. Drug smuggling. Dummy. Electro optical targeting system. Escalate. Escort. Expendable. Extraction. Fighter bomber. Fly by wire controls. Flying boom. Folding rotor blades. Food distribution. Force protection. Force structure. Foreign internal defense, FID. Forward air controller, FAC. Forward looking infrared system. Friendly fire. Friendly forces. Global positioning system, GPS. Ground based radar. Gunship. Heliborn. Hoist. Host nation. Hostile targets. Hover. Humanitarian. Illicit narcotics. Independent disconnect system. Inertial navigation system. Insertion. Intercontinental. Interdiction. International Organization, I.O. ISR, Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance. JAMA. Joint Interagency Task Force, J.I.A.T.F. Joint Terminal Attack Controller, JTAC. Lift Capacity. Limited Intervention. Localized conflict. Long range strike mission. Low level operations. MAC. Machine guns. Major theater war, MTW. Maximum. Medical Civic Action Program, MEDCAP. Medical Staff Military Operations Other Than War, MUTWA Missile Mission Creep Multipoint Refueling System, MPRS Munition No-Fly Zone Non-Ballistic Non-Combatant Evacuation Order, 
NEO. Non government organization, NGO. Nuclear capable. On board. Pallet. Preemptive. Probe. Proximity. Radar. Radar dome. Reconnaissance. Recon. Recoverable. Redeployment. Refuel. Refugee. Regional stability. Remote control. Resupply. Rotodome. Search and rescue. SAR. Show of force. Side firing. Simulate. Small scale contingency. SSC. Soft target. Special operations. Strafe. Strategic bomber. Strategic targets. Strike. Strut. Submersibles. Suppression of enemy air defense. Seed. Surgical firepower. Surveillance. Surveillance platform. Sustainment. Swept wing. Tactical air control party. TACP. Tactical bomber. Tactical targets. Tail assembly. Tanker. Target. Target acquisition. Target of opportunity. Targeted elimination. Terrain contour matching. TECOM. Theater. Theater Security Cooperation Strategy. TSCS. Thrust nozzles. Turbofan. UAV. Unmanned aerial vehicle. Warhead. Watercraft. Weapons bay. Wingspan. Wingtip pod. Book 3. Chapter 1. Famous units. Unit 1. Fighter unit. Exercise 1. Page 4. Over 70 fighter groups of the U.S. Army Air Forces flew during World War II, yet none was as successful as the 49th, which recorded more kills than any other group. The 49th Fighter Group flew in World War II's Pacific Theater of Operations. It operated the P-40 Warhawk, the P-47 Thunderbolt, and the P-38 Lightning. These fighters were slower and less maneuverable than their enemy counterpart, the Japanese Zero. So the 49th studied dissimilar tactics in dogfights, which allowed them to develop a hit-and-run strategy to overcome those disadvantages. The group was an important part of stopping Japanese advances in key battle zones of the Pacific. 49th Fighter Group pilots shot down nearly 700 enemy aircraft, more than any other group in the entire war. The 49th was awarded three distinguished unit citations and ten battle honours. In the process, 43 pilots became aces. One ace of the 49th, Major Richard Bong, brought down four enemy aircraft in a single sortie. His total number of kills was 40 at the time he was removed from active duty, an achievement no American pilot has ever matched. Exercise 4, page 5. Lieutenant Klein, tell me, what are dissimilar tactics? Ma'am, dissimilar tactics are the maneuvers and strategies of aircraft with different capabilities. Correct. And when did the study of dissimilar tactics begin? In World War II, ma'am. 
Right again. Explain why. Ma'am, the Japanese Zero was a faster and more maneuverable plane than Allied aircraft. Fighters had to study dissimilar tactics to find a weakness. And what weakness did they find, Airman? Ma'am, the Zero was faster in dogfights and turns, but the P 40 could dive faster than the Zero. Keep going. How did Allied pilots use that to their advantage? They attacked from above. It was a hit and run strategy. The P 40s climbed above the Zeros, then they dove and fired. But instead of entering a dogfight, they continued the dive. The Zeros couldn't catch them. Excellent answer, Klein. Now, the P 40s still couldn't match the Zero in a direct engagement, but studying dissimilar tactics showed Allied pilots how to bring down the superior aircraft. Unit 2, Bomber Unit. Exercise 1, page 6. A successful bombing mission can change the course of a war, and one World War II bombardment group conducted two such operations. The 17th Bombardment Group not only struck the first blow against Japan, but also inflicted strategic damage in the struggle against Germany. On April the 18th, 1942, just four months after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the 17th Bombardment Group conducted a retaliatory attack against Japan. The mission came to be known as the Doolittle Raid. A squadron of 16 heavily modified B 25 Mitchell bombers were loaded onto an aircraft carrier and taken by ship across the Pacific Ocean. Their combat launch targeted Tokyo in order to prove that even that city was vulnerable. The bombers dropped their payloads on the city, but failed to reach a safe airfield and crash landed throughout China. Still, the mission had a powerful impact on Allied troop morale. The 17th went on to play pivotal roles in numerous other campaigns. Perhaps most notable was its contribution to the battle at Schweinfurt, Germany on April the 10th, 1945. Allied ground troops had advanced to the edge of the fortified city, but needed air support. The 17th assaulted the city with a squadron of B 26 Marauder bombers in an attack so devastating that infantry took control of the city with virtually no opposition. Exercise 4, page 7. It's important to remember that missions can have different objectives. Some missions are directed at strategic targets, but other missions are conducted for reconnaissance, diversion, even morale. In fact, sometimes a mission can have very little strategic significance, yet be extremely important. For example, one of the most famous missions of World War II was aimed at boosting morale the Doolittle Raid. This was the first air raid that the US launched against Japan. The bombers hit their targets. But the physical damage they inflicted wasn't important. It didn't limit Japan's ability to wage war, and the cost was significant. Eleven airmen died, and every single B 25 that took off was destroyed. Yet, despite the death and destruction, the mission was considered a success. It demonstrated that the US could strike even the center of Japan. It gave the US military and public hope that they would prevail over their enemy. Unit 3. Search and Rescue, Exercise 1, page 8. The goal of all SAR operations is to save lives. But in some operations, airmen must put their own lives at risk to save the lives of others. One such operation occurred in the Somali city of Mogadishu. In 1994, a U.S. Army MH 60 helicopter was shot down there by RPG fire. A CSAR team, including three airmen from the 24th Special Tactics Squadron, Was immediately sent to the location. The CSAR team encountered fire as soon as it arrived at the crash site. Pararescue technician Sergeant Scott Fales was shot in the leg. As Sergeant Fales went to the triage point, Sergeant Timothy Wilkinson, another pararescue technician, went to the downed helicopter. Inside were five injured Army Rangers. Under fire, Sergeant Wilkinson carried the wounded men to the triage point one by one. Sergeant Fales provided medical care and covering fire from the triage point, despite his own injury. Because the first relief convoy could not reach the incident site, the CSAR team had to take cover in nearby buildings. Sergeant Jeffrey Bray, a combat controller, directed close air support operations until a second convoy arrived. He coordinated fire as close as 15 meters away from himself. His actions prevented any friendly fire casualties. Sergeant Fales and Sergeant Bray each received the Silver Star for their actions. 
Sergeant Wilkinson received the Air Force Cross. All three credited their special operations training for their success. Exercise 4, page 9. Delta 5, Delta 5. This is Delta 17. What is your position? Over. Delta 17, this is Delta 5. We're at the incident site now. Over. Send a status report. Over. We've got three wounded. Two are on their way to your location. ETA, five minutes. The helicopter is completely inoperative. Over. Say again, Delta 5. How many wounded? Over. I say again, three wounded. Two on their way to your location. ETA, five minutes. Over. Roger that. Triage point is ready. What's going on with the third wounded? Over. It's the pilot. The cabin door was damaged in the crash. We're having trouble getting him out. Over. Cut it open if you have to. We've got hostile movement nearby. Over. We've got another ten minutes here at least. Over. Better have Delta 4 set up for covering fire. We'll get you an update from hostile location. Over. Wilco Delta 5, out. Chapter 2. Targeting the enemy. Unit 4. Targets. Exercise 1, page 10. In the past, commanders stood upon hilltops in order to get a clear view of a battle and manage troops. Today's commanders follow in their footsteps, but they make their observations from a much higher viewpoint. A modern observation system called the Joint Surveillance Target Attack Radar System, JSTARS, allows commanders to identify targets and manage the battlefield from the air. The goal of this highly specialized radar system is to relay tactical information of target-rich environments to ground forces. First, JSTARS identifies the number of elements in an environment, including vehicles and heavy weaponry. JSTARS use radar to make contact with targets and any other emerging targets that appear and to give positive identification for these threats. Not all targets are single objects. Area targets that contain multiple buildings or enemy bunkers are of special interest. JSTARS can actually determine the degree of protection in these areas and identify enemy weak points. This allows for effects-based targeting, which engages the most important targets first in order to reduce enemy resistance faster than standard attacks. JSTARS relays all of the area target information to ground forces. With detailed information on enemy targets and weak points, ground forces are able to assign appropriate forces to drive the battle forward. Furthermore, when friendly ground forces are on the battlefield, JSTARS ensures that they are clear of friendly fire. JSTARS can even notify ground elements if they are danger close to pending explosions that result from air attacks. By doing so, JSTARS limits friendly casualties by giving the troops time to find cover. Exercise 4, page 11. Hotel 44, this is Red Cap. Be advised we have discovered enemy mobilization in Sector 7. There are four enemy targets in motion north of your position. They are steadily moving southbound on the supply road. Roger that. What are we looking at? Targets are enemy armored transport vehicles. They look to be mounted with fully automatic machine guns. These units are typically not heavily armored from the side and are vulnerable to perpendicular fire. Understood. How much time do we have? Looks like they have an ETA at your position about five minutes. Got it. Red Cap, do you see a good site for an ambush? Hotel 44, we're seeing a depression on the east side of the supply road. It's about 200 yards north of your position. Take your squad up and prepare RPGs. Wilco, Red Cap, Hotel 44 out. Unit 5. Air-to-air missiles. Exercise 1, page 13. With their unmatched speed and explosive capability, air-to-air missiles are a pilot's best method of defense against enemy aircraft. Although air-to-air missiles vary widely in firing range and target-seeking technology, they are all designed to reach targets with impressive accuracy. The AIM-9X Sidewinder is one of the oldest and most effective air-to-air missiles. Originally designed as a within-visual-range AAM, it has developed into a short-range AAM with heat-seeking ability. The Sidewinder is equipped with a high-explosive warhead and is propelled by a rocket motor capable of travelling at supersonic speeds, making it ideal for close-quarter aerial combat scenarios. The AIM-7 Sparrow is the most common medium-range AAM used today. It is equipped with radar that detects and hones in on targets from any direction. 
Because it does not detect a target plane's exhaust, it can be used for head-on attacks. When the AIM-7 Sparrow approaches a target, a proximity fuse senses the target and detonates before collision. The AIM-120 AMRAM is an upgrade of the AIM-7 Sparrow. A beyond visual range AAM, it has a greater maximum engagement range than its predecessor. It is smaller, lighter, and has better target-seeking maneuverability. Although the AIM-120 AMRAM uses the most advanced AAM technology, the technology is very new and expensive to implement. As such, it is not yet widely used. Exercise 4, page 13. Delta 7, this is Blackjack. Do you have the bandit in visual range? Affirmative, Blackjack. Are there any friendlies nearby? There are no friendlies in your section. Repeat, no friendlies in your AO. Understood. Bandit is moving out. Delta 7, what is the target distance? Approximately 30 kilometers, moving fast. Request permission to engage. Permission granted. Engage target. Roger. Bandit is engaging in evasive maneuvers. Maintain visual range and keep tracking target. I'm trying to lock target. Notify when target is locked. Target is locked. Firing Fox 2. Roger that. Fox 2 fired. What is the bandit status? SRAM detonated. Bandit has been destroyed. Unit 6. Air to surface missiles. Exercise 1, page 14. There was a time when a ground assault required thousands of troops and hundreds of aircraft. Today, air-to-ground missiles' destructive capability and precision serve the role of those units. The AGM-65 Maverick is the most common air-to-surface missile in use today. As a launch-and-leave missile, it allows pilots to engage other targets as soon as they fire. The AGM-65 has multiple capabilities made possible by its modular design. Different target-seeking assemblies and warheads can be interchanged to fit specific targets. The result is a custom missile inside the AGM-54 shell that can be used for anti-ship or anti-tank purposes. For instance, tanks and other hard targets require missile warheads with a delayed fuse. Once the missile makes initial contact with the target, the explosion does not occur until the missile has penetrated into the core of the target. Using this technology, there is a higher probability of damage for armoured targets. If a target demonstrates evasive action and avoids a pilot's gun line, a laser or infrared module can be used as the missile seeking system. These systems track and pursue the target while the pilot remains at a safe standoff distance. After the pilot fires, he can monitor the progress of the missile on a video screen in order to confirm impact. Exercise 4, page 15. Bravo 2, this is Delta 15. Delta 15, Bravo 2, go. I'm closing in on the target area, but it's no joy. No visible enemy activity yet. What is your position? I'm half a click south of the target coordinates. Stay on course. Ground units have confirmed target. Notify when target is spotted. Got it. I now have a visual on target. Maintain altitude and proceed with caution. Target is in my gun line. Fire when ready, Delta 15. Roger. Target is locked. Missile away. Unit 7. Surface to air missiles. Exercise 1, page 16. In the 1940s, anti-aircraft artillery guns fired countless rounds in their attempt to destroy enemy aircraft, and more often than not, the aircraft sped away, entirely unharmed. Today, ground-based anti-aircraft weapons may only need to fire one weapon, the SAM, which can destroy airborne targets with deadly accuracy. Surface-to-air missiles target aircraft from the ground, with most being infrared missiles that lock onto a target by detecting the radiation or heat that the target emits. This heat-seeking technology allows a fired missile to track a moving aircraft. SAMs are often deployed by launchers attached to armoured vehicles. These missiles have a range of several hundred kilometres. Other SAMs are shoulder-launched missiles called Man Portable Air Defence Systems, MANPADS. A MANPADS range is only about five kilometres, but it can be fired by a single person on foot. SAMs are typically operated by Command to Line of Sight, CLOS systems, although some are laser-guided. As SAM technology improves, so do the countermeasures used to avoid them. Aircraft release decoy flares to confuse a missile's heat-seeking mechanism. The aircraft then slows to cool the engine, and the missile follows the heat from the flare instead. 
More sophisticated countermeasures use technologies that interfere with the laser signals that guide missiles. Exercise 4, page 17. Needles, this is Charlie 5. We've reached the target area. Roger, Charlie 5. Hostile fire reported in the area. Stand by. Roger, Needles. Standing by. OK, Charlie 5. Recon has detected a mobile vehicle with IR SAMs on the ground at the target location and possible support arriving from the southwest. Roger. Needles, we have missile fire. Roger that, Charlie 5. Give a status update when ready. Flares deployed. Missile is clear. Good to know, Charlie 5. You... Say again? I say again, abort mission, Charlie 5. Scram immediately. Roger, Needles. Aborting mission and returning to base. Unit 8. Cannons. Exercise 1, page 18. Speed is a critical factor in a successful air-to-air -air attack, as just a moment of hesitation can give the target enough time to move safely out of range. For this reason, fighters carry cannons, rapid-fire weapons which fire hundreds of rounds in a matter of seconds. The Gatling gun was one of the earliest rapid-fire weapons. Its rotating barrels deploy multiple rounds at a high rate of fire. Today's rapid-fire cannons still use the basic mechanisms. Although cannons use similar technology to that of Gatling guns, a cannon typically has a higher calibre and fires cartridges with explosive shells instead of bullets, making it more effective for engaging aircraft. Some cannons fire thousands of rounds per minute. As these weapons become more powerful and their muzzle velocity increases, so does the backward force they exert. To prevent cannons from damaging mounts or aircraft, many are fitted with recoil adapters. Cannons also risk overheating when fired too quickly and for too long. Some fire more slowly to allow for sustained firing, while others fire more quickly, but must be used only in short bursts. Today's cannons are known for speed, but they are also useful because of their ability to penetrate aircraft. High explosive dual purpose HEDP weapons with armor piercing capabilities cause substantial damage to targets without requiring repeated fire. Exercise 4, page 19. Long neck, this is Bravo 2-2, approaching hostile target. We are Arizona. Repeat, we have used our last AIM-120. Should we engage? Please advise. Bravo 2-2, ID target. We might go ahead with guns. Looks like two Kiowa helicopters. They might be OH-58. Roger, Bravo 2-2. Which guns are you carrying? We have four BK-47s. Roger, Bravo 2-2. Those will work. Prepare to fire. Roger, Long Neck. We're prepared to fire. The target is in range. Roger, Bravo 2-2. Fire at will. Roger. Firing Fox 4. Target 1 is going down. Roger, Bravo 2-2. Can you engage Target 2? Negative, Long Neck. Target is heading out. Roger, Bravo 2-2. Cease fire and return to base. Wilco, Long Neck. Unit 9. Anti-ship and anti-submarine. Exercise 1, page 21. Modern aircraft hunt down the enemy in every environment. They engage aircraft in the sky and destroy units on the ground. Yet aircraft must also seek out and destroy enemy units on and below the surface of the water. For this purpose, military aircraft are outfitted with anti-ship and anti-submarine weapons. Attacking surface ships from the air is significantly easier than attacking a submarine. Missiles like the AGM-84 Harpoon are capable of destroying such watercraft from hundreds of kilometers away. These missiles travel undetected for long distances by using the technique of sea skimming. If a target moves unexpectedly, mid-course guidance allows pilots to adjust the missile's course to the new location. Yet submarines present a greater challenge, even to modern aircraft. Their ability to hide deep beneath the surface increases their ability to evade detection and protects them from much of an aircraft's arsenal. In fact, anti-submarine warfare focuses more on locating these underwater threats than it does on destroying them. Common submarine detection methods include sonar, radar, and magnetic anomaly detectors, MADS, and laser detection and ranging, LADAR. These devices attach to the fuselage of aircraft dedicated to locating enemy submarines. Once a submarine is located, 
helicopters can be deployed to drop torpedoes, mines or depth charges. However, these weapons must be deployed before a submarine dives to a depth beyond the weapon's reach. Exercise 4, page 21. Delta-19, this is Red Station. There's an enemy transport ship travelling south from the Far Island, heading 170, range 40 nautical miles. Turning 170. Is Target Sam equipped? Negative, Delta-19. Transport is a soft target. It should be on your radar soon. Inform when you have target. Red Station, I have a bogey at 021. Is that our target? Affirmative, Delta-19. That's him. Roger, Red Station. I have a lock. Launching missile. Red Station, missile has failed to launch. Copy. What other ordnance is on board? We're holding a Mark 5 torpedo. It's anti-submarine, but it could take out that transport. Roger. Clear to launch when you reach torpedo range. Delta-19. Cleared hot. Chapter 3. Attack. Unit 10. Centers of Gravity. Exercise 1. Page 22. Some battles match the full strength of two militaries. In such conflicts, commanders risk great losses to their own forces in order to destroy as much of the enemy's forces as possible. Yet concentrated attacks on vital targets can be just as damaging, and with far less loss of friendly units than in wars of attrition. In this type of engagement, leaders launch strategic attacks targeting enemy's centers of gravity, COG. The Air Force can interrupt the flow of vital communications and materials by targeting operational processes and infrastructure. This interferes with the enemy's COG while avoiding widespread collateral damage and significant casualties. By focusing attacks on the enemy's decisive points, the Air Force preserves its own troops and resources. It also adheres to the law of armed conflict by minimizing combat that could affect civilians. The popular will in a particular region will be less hostile towards a foreign military if civilians remain safe. Air Force leadership is trained to identify which critical vulnerabilities will produce the highest payoff for the lowest cost. Commanders will avoid deploying fielded forces if an air attack can accomplish the same goal. Instead of attacking directly, an Air Force unit might destroy the enemy's weapons cache. These tactics still disable the enemy, but cause less damage to the region overall and use fewer resources. Exercise 4, page 23. You have been selected for a special operation. We'll launch early tomorrow morning. We've discovered a large munitions factory in the northern foothills and your mission is to destroy it. We estimate that 40% of the rebels' weaponry comes out of this facility, so it's one of their critical vulnerabilities. The factory employs 200 civilian workers. But our intelligence shows that the building is empty between 2100 hours and 0600 hours. We're trying to avoid civilian casualties, so we'll launch the attack at 0100 hours when nobody's there. We're only deploying a flight of four A-10s for this operation, and we're counting on each of you to give us maximum payoff. Knocking out this facility will save a lot of lives on the ground. Unit 11. Surprise Attack. Exercise 1, page 25. There are some commanders who believe that modern technology makes a surprise attack impossible. With radar and reconnaissance, they say, no major military unit can be caught off guard. On January the 17th, 1991, a coalition of several nations proved that the surprise attack is still a factor in modern warfare. That day, coalition forces attacked Iraqi military units in Kuwait. The operation, known as Desert Storm, was a quick and effective attack that relied upon asymmetric force strategy. During the early hours of the attack, coalition aircraft bombed Iraqi airports, communication centers, and command posts with precision employment. In the first 24 hours alone, more than 1,300 fighters were employed in combat. The direct effect of the attacks was the destruction of important Iraqi military resources. The indirect effect was the severe limitation of Iraq's freedom of action. Although the Air Force also used force-on-force -force engagement, the lasting success of the mission came from sudden attacks against COGs. While Iraqi leaders knew these COGs were targets, 
the decisive maneuver, range and flexibility of coalition aircraft were greater than they had anticipated. Parallel operations and time-on-target coordination left Iraqi units without sufficient time or resources to strike back or protect those targets effectively. Exercise 4, page 25 Sir, I'm ready to give my report on phase 1 of the operation. We focused on disabling transportation in the southern and western regions. We used six F-117 Nighthawks to destroy the railroad stations on each side of the mountain pass. The Nighthawks then targeted the bridges, entering the two major cities. That should prevent the enemy's troops and supplies from reaching the west. After we took out the roads, we launched parallel attacks using TOT on the two main airports. We were worried that the enemy base in the south might have enough firepower to strike, but we had the advantage of surprise. By the time their commanders were informed of the incident, we had already left the area. And, as a result of our attack, no ground supplies can reach the enemy. Unit 12. Strategic Attack Exercise 1, page 26 A commander doesn't have to destroy all enemy forces or deploy all of his own to win. He only has to strike strategic targets which will have the same effect on an enemy's capabilities. Strategic attack is a form of offensive force that achieves specific effects-based goals. As such, strategic attack differs from standard operational level combat. Strategic attacks are coordinated to gain a disproportionate advantage over an enemy. In other words, instead of going head-to-head -head with the enemy, a strategic attack seeks to use minimal force and resources to accomplish objectives. Strategic attacks may appear similar to conventional tactics that are employed in the pursuit of operational objectives. The key difference is that a strategic attack is used in the pursuit of a specific strategic objective. For example, commanders may choose to strike a key base or center of enemy power, thus crippling an entire segment of their opponent's forces. Such a strategy would obviously be more effective and less costly than a sequential fight through the enemy's lines of defense. Pilots still routinely employ traditional tactics like fighter sweeps and offensive counter-air maneuvers. But modern strategic attacks are quickly replacing these methods as the norm. The large benefits and small risks of strategic attacks are obvious. A single pilot may disable entire squadrons by striking key targets on a master attack list. The preservation of resources that follow such strategic attacks is a powerful incentive to today's military leaders. Exercise 4, page 27 I am pleased to report that the strategic attack was a complete success. I believe we have achieved our strategic objective. My flight departed as planned at 0600 and proceeded from Command Central to the assigned targets. We arrived at the first target on my master target list at approximately 0800. At that time, I observed all 15 aircraft of the enemy squadron grounded. We engaged the target and received minimal anti-air fire. The first target, the primary fuel reserve, at the enemy base was destroyed. I ordered the flight to proceed to the second target, the fuel pipeline that runs across the valley next to the enemy base. I destroyed two sections of the pipeline. Without the fuel reserve or a pipeline, all enemy aircraft will be unable to take off. Unit 13. Psychological Effects. Exercise 1, page 29. Warfare is more than just violent confrontations between armed forces. Especially in modern times, warring parties utilize various methods of psychological warfare. While this warfare takes many forms, the goals are basically the same. Psychological operations, or psyops, are any activities that are conducted for the purpose of altering an adversary's mental and emotional strength. No military branch is better equipped to conduct these operations than air forces. There is some variety in the psychological effects that result from Air Force PSYOPs. A show of force operation may simply light up the afterburners of bombers over a target area, which is known to instill fear in enemy populations, thus reducing their effectiveness in battle, or an action may be taken to reduce an opponent's will to fight. For example, Air Forces may use a technique called shock and awe, a technique involving a massive display of firepower that is large enough to incite panic in opponents. Targeted eliminations can also be a component of psychological warfare, as UAV strikes against key figures can result in an altered political climate. 
The adversary may then be coerced to surrender or acquiesce to diplomatic initiatives. In addition to these violent types of psyops, air units also provide non-violent methods of psychological manipulation. For instance, aircraft may distribute propaganda in the form of written materials or radio broadcasts. Similarly, specially modified aircraft can jam the radio and TV signals within enemy territory. This limits the enemy's ability to communicate and allows friendly forces to control the information being released. By controlling information, commanders have great influence over how people in the region feel. Exercise 4, page 29. This group is getting too dangerous. We should talk about taking out their leadership. It's an option, but we need to consider the risks too. Think about it. Taking out their top men would cause confusion, and it might discourage people from taking their place. Yes, it could reduce their will to fight, but it could also have the opposite effect. Do you really think so? It's possible. They could use the strike as propaganda. It might encourage the fighters to take revenge. Or worse, the organization could use it to recruit more fighters. I see what you mean. So what do you suggest? Let's fly over with a new round of broadcasts in the region. We'll keep aircraft over their airspace to jam any broadcasts from the leadership too. That's not enough. We need more than just psyops on this. I agree. But if we can reduce public support for the group, we might not incite a negative reaction with a targeted elimination. Fair enough. Get aircraft up to jam signals as soon as possible. Unit 14. Joint Air Attack Team. Exercise 1, page 31. The importance of ground units in combat is undeniable. Infantry meets enemies face to face in order to destroy or repel them. Yet ground troops can accomplish their objectives best when they have the support of surgical air attacks. Operations that coordinate air and ground units are the responsibility of a Joint Air Attack Team, JAAT. A JAAT is a group of Air Force units working together with other armed forces in pursuit of strategic objectives. Because JAAT operations involve multiple military branches, there is a need for some form of joint leadership. This is accomplished primarily through a Joint Air Operations Center, JOC. The JOC plans and oversees any JAAT operation from start to finish. After planning an operation, the JOC issues an air tasking order, ATO. This order circulates to all units and subordinate command centers. It contains the details of the sorties aircraft will fly in support of ground units. JAAT operations require special considerations because of their complexity. Of the utmost concern is the need for coordinating measures. Units from different armed services require precise direction in order to avoid errors that could jeopardize the operation or result in friendly fire. Preventing such mistakes is the responsibility of Battlefield Coordination Detachments, BCD, and Forward Air Controllers, FAC. Both work to provide detailed information on enemy and friendly unit locations. These specialists not only help plan and execute JAAT operations, they also arrange for a rapid response to fire support or theater airlift requests. Exercise 4, page 31. Delta 32, this is Jackknife. Acknowledge. Jackknife, this is Delta 32. Go ahead. Delta 32, proceed to primary target, heading 316. Roger, Jackknife. Proceeding to primary target. Delta 32, do you have visual on target? Tally, Jackknife. I have an enemy T-72 tank. Permission to engage. Negative, negative. Do not engage. Hold for friendlies on the far side of the compound. Roger, Jackknife. Holding. Delta 3-2, our FAC says the ground units have moved out. You are cleared hot. Roger, Jackknife. I am committed. Getting a lock. Radar locked. Firing. Missile away. Delta 3-2, report. Splash 1, Jackknife. I repeat, target destroyed. Roger that, Delta 3-2. Those friendlies on the ground need an airlift. Provide cover until the Black Hawk arrives. Call when clear. Will code, Jackknife. Unit 15, phases of attack. Exercise 1, page 32. 
An F-16 strikes and destroys a key radar facility and anti-aircraft battery, limiting the enemy's air power. Completing such a mission might require only a few hours. However, the airstrike would be just one step in the many phases of an attack. All attacks begin with the Commander-in-Chief, C&C, who prioritizes an objective. In the case of the F-16 strike, the objective might be moving beyond air parity to air superiority. Target development is the next phase. In it, military commanders establish a target set to attack in order to achieve that objective, such as the radar and anti-aircraft weaponry of the enemy. After creating a target set, commanders enter weaponeering assessment, a phase in which they choose the best weapons and aircraft for an attack. The F-16's speed and joint direct attack munition, JDAM, capabilities would make it the perfect weapon for an air-to-ground strike. After the targets, weapons and aircraft are selected, commanders decide upon a mission flow. At this point, the attack is executed and the target set is engaged. Yet the attack planning is not complete. Combat assessment follows, in which commanders apply measures of merit to determine if the attack accomplished objectives. This relies upon battle damage assessment, a report that details the physical damage to targets. In the case of the F-16 strike, completely destroying the targets would have accomplished the objective. By eliminating the enemy's radar and anti-aircraft defences, the Air Force would have moved closer to air superiority. Exercise 4, page 33. Ninth Squadron just executed the attack. They're on their way back now. So, how did it go? Early battle damage assessment looks good. I mean really good. It appears that they completely destroyed the radar facility. Excellent. I wasn't sure if they could pull that off. What about the anti-aircraft batteries? Early recon shows that they took heavy damage, but some of them are still functional. Well, that was expected. Do we need another attack on that target set? I'm not sure. Even with the remaining anti-aircraft guns, we made operations in the region much safer. How so? They can still fire on our pilots. That's why we hit the radar facility. Without it, the anti-air artillery will have trouble targeting. Good point. Well, let's prepare the combat assessment report and see what the general has to say. Glossary Ace Achieve Acquiesce Advance Adversary AGM-65 Maverick AGM-84 Harpoon Air Force Cross Air Parity Air Support Air Tasking Order, ATO Aircraft Carrier Airfield Air-to-air -air missile Air-to-ground missile Air-to-surface missile Anti-ship Anti-submarine Anti-tank Area target Armor-piercing Armored vehicle Asymmetric force strategy B-25 Mitchell B-26 Marauder Battle Damage Assessment, BDA Battle Honor Battle Zone Battlefield Coordination Detachment, BCD Beyond Visual Range AAM Bring Down Broadcast Caliber Campaign Cannon Cartridge Center of Gravity, COG Coerce Combat Assessment, CA Combat Controller Combat Launch Combat Search and Rescue Team Command to Line of Sight, CLOS Commander-in-Chief, 
CNC. Contact. Coordinating measures. Covering fire. Critical vulnerability. Danger close. Decisive maneuver. Decisive point. Decoy flare. Degree of protection. Delayed fuse. Depth charge. Detonate. Diplomatic initiative. Direct effect. Disproportionate. Dissimilar tactics. Dogfight. Doolittle raid. Downed. Effects based targeting. Effects based. Emerging target. Evasive action. Execute. Fielded forces. Fighter sweep. Fire support. Flexibility. Force on force engagement. Fortified. Forward air controller. FAC. Freedom of action. Gatling gun. Gunline. Hard target. Head on. Head to head. Heat seeking. High explosive dual purpose. Hit and run. Incident sight. In sight. Indirect effect. Infrared missile. Infrastructure. Jam. Jeopardize. Joint Air Attack Team, JAAT. Joint Air Operations Center, JOC. Joint Direct Attack Munition, JDAM. Joint Surveillance Target Attack Radar System, JSTARS. Kill. Laser Detection and Ranging. Laser Guided. Launch and Leave. Launcher. Law of Armed Conflict. Leadership. Magnetic Anomaly Detector. Man Portable Air Defense System. Master Attack List. Maximum Engagement Range. Measure of Merit. Medium Range Double AM, MRAM. Mid Course Guidance. Mine. Mission Flow. Modified. Modular Design. Muzzle Velocity. Number of Elements. Offensive Counter Air. Operational Level Combat. Operational Objective. Operational Processes. Overheat. Parallel Operations. Pararescue Technician. Payoff. Phase. Political Climate. Popular Will. Positive identification. Precision employment. Prioritize. Probability of damage. Propaganda. Proximity fuse. Psychological effect. Psyops. Range. Range. Rate of fire. Recoil adapter. 
Relief Convoy Retaliatory Rocket Propelled Grenade, RPG Rounds Per Minute Sea Skimming Sequential Fight Shock and Awe Short Range Double AM Shoulder Launched Silver Star Sortie Special Tactics Squadron Standoff Distance Strategic Strategic Attack Strategic Objective Strategy Subordinate Surface Ship Surface-to-air missile. Surprise. Target development. Target-rich environment. Target set. Theater airlift. Time on target. Torpedo. Triage point. Weaponeering assessment. Weapons cache. Will to fight. Within visual range double AM.